Hey everybody and welcome back to the Unreal Engine Live uh, training stream. I almost said Unreal Engine Live stream, it's the Unreal Engine training stream today. And uh, today we have Ed on. Ed's going to be talking about his morph targets and characters. So we're going to hop right into the main screen here. And uh, Ed, tell us what's going down. This is going to be a very content creation driven stream. Yep. I'm going to talk about kind of the basics of creating things in uh, 3ds Max as well as different uh, workflows for morph targets. And I know I saw a question earlier about kind of the uh, advantages of morph targets versus, you know, using bones. So I'll, I'll kind of go into that briefly. So uh, let's just hop right in. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you want to be in 3ds Max or? Before? I'll just move it over to this window so it's okay. fine. You're all good. So very general um, concept for morphs is you can think of it as just kind of like, what is a morph, right? So. Think of it as just a set of positions that are stored, as well as uh, a number of each like vertices position stored. Each vertex has a number associated with it. So just kind of keep that in mind and remember that. And it's going to make a lot more sense whenever I kind of start showing the process. Uh, I want you guys, if you are feeling up to it, to follow along. Um, we're going to be using the mannequin at first, just so I can show you the process of importing a morph target and creating it. So uh, you can take the mannequin. You can get this from the third person content examples. Or yeah, so that's pretty easy to use. Yeah, right and if, if you don't have it in your project, you can uh, do add to project, which is yeah, just that's actually new. how I got it. Yeah, because this new. wasn't like by default in here. Yeah, and you can do add feature content pack mm -hmm. and just select third person. You can just right click that and under Asset Actions, then Export. I've already done this to save some time and opened it up in 3ds Max. So let's bring it over. All right. So the first thing I like to do is get rid of this dummy right here, because that causes issues whenever uh, re-importing. Another thing that I like to do is get rid of uh, the editable mesh modifier. Let's get rid of that message. And we'll add the edit poly. Wow, that text is really small. Wow, that's, yeah, we actually scaled everything up and that's still very small. <laughs> I apologize for that. That's fine. I'll just have to lean in super far. That's just a warning message stating that you're going to lose things under the stack. There might be problems with that, but this is fine. Mm -hmm. All right, let me drag that over. So the, we have our mesh right here. Whenever you're creating a morph target, you want to make an exact copy of your existing character. And that, the reason for that is, like I was stating, all a morph target is is a stored location for all the verts in your mesh. So if you don't have the same vert count, then it's not going to properly associate each vert to its new location, if that makes sense. That's, a, that's kind of a, an important note on morph targets in general. It doesn't add or remove vertices. Right. So there's no change in that. It just moves their location. Yeah, so you can't really do anything optimization-wise on that front. But you can use LODs with morphs which I'll actually be covering because I think that can have some pretty good application for a character designer. If you have like a really big character mm -hmm. and it LODs you know, to a, uh, a lower detail, if you're at a distance and your character's huge, like you have a morph target making your character you know, chubby, you're going to see a very drastic change if the uh, morph isn't working properly because your chubby character is going to go to the skinny like base you just character. Pop right in. Yeah, you're going to see really bad popping. So you have to make sure that you set it up uh, properly because it can be pretty tricky getting LODs working with morph targets. But uh, we'll, we'll cover that in a bit. All right. Uh, first thing I want to do is name the character. This is actually going to, uh, whatever you name this, we'll just call it morph. That's going to be the name of your morph target in the editor. 
So it's pretty important that you name everything or else you're going to get character one, character two, and it's going to get really confusing. And from this point, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, let's just make some very basic edits to them. Uh, most of the time when I'm making morph targets, I actually will utilize the soft selection tool. And this is great for more organic edits because when you kind of scale out. Yeah, everything kind of yeah, naturally it, pulls with it. It makes things a bit smoother to work with. So we're going to give this guy a little bit of a gut. The workflow can differ depending on what you're doing. So if you have to make, like we were talking about, uh, you know, tongue animations earlier. Oh yeah, yeah. That's going to be a bit more difficult because the tongue can move in such strange ways. Uh, one trick that I, I like to use sometimes is to actually create a very primitive uh, rig and use bones to animate the tongue into the different positions and then just use that current pose as a morph target. And we might actually, hopefully if we have time, I will show you that process. There is a chance that we might not get into it because uh, it can be time consuming. So let's make him sufficiently plump. Yeah, he's gonna be, you know, in all the, you know, proportionately <laughs> plump in all the directions. It's important. Oh, another thing that's really important to note. When you add your morpher modifier, it has to be underneath the skin modifier. If it's above, that's actually going to uh, cause it to nullify. Anything above the skin modifier gets disregarded whenever you export it and put it into the engine. <clears throat> so that's just a really important thing to keep track of. All right. All right, so you've just added a morpher modifier, and now we're going to start throwing in morphs. Yep. All right, so you notice that there's this button down here, pick object from a scene. You just pick the current morph target. It's just a copy of your character. And then the slider will allow it to change to match that. Cool. So and this that, is and that actually answers the question on the chat, which was just straight up, what is a morph target exactly? And so now this is a good visual display. Yeah, now I can actually talk about things that are really important to think about. So it's just stored locations. So each vert has a number, right? So if I were to click on this vert, I can't really read the number, but this this has a specific number associated to it. 3,963, yeah. or that's, 36. That's really important because if the ordering changes, it uses that number to figure out what position to go to. So it's going to find in the morph target the associated vert number and then move to that position. Um, and then you can get horrific, like it's actually really easy to mess that up if you add geometry or if you make little edits that you, like let's just say you're making a morph target and while making edits, I'm going to cut. So that created like two more verts that weren't yeah. there before. And that's not going to, it's actually going to nullify the morph target because the, the number count of verts changed. Okay, so now it's just completely dead to the other one. But I want to kind of make the point that you can have morph targets that seem like they work even though they're technically not going to. So let's see, control, backspace. And I'm just gonna need a second to set it up. What I'm essentially doing is I'm going to take verts that weren't supposed to be there, so they're gonna alter the vert number. Because when you add something to a stack, it normally gets added to the top, but if you delete a vert that was previously not there, and then you try to add it back in again. Actually, let me just screw this up a little bit more. All right. 
Now, Alex, I'm going to need your cooperation with this. All right. Because you're the one with the glasses. All right, yes, sir. <laughs> and actually, no, I can read it. Oh, <laughs> bridge. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, like this is actually really hard to work on because everything's so tiny. And I don't have the ideal vision. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the UI is totally different in the engine, which is scaled properly. And here it's super tiny. Yeah. Uh, actually, you might want to ask, ask the stream if they can see OK. Because I imagine it might be pretty small for them, too. Yeah, right. Well, you just did, actually. That's how that works. So, uh, yeah. stream that. <laughs> stream, can you see what we're doing? <laughs> or is it just a garbled, tiny little thing that... There we go. Uh, Chad says yes. All right, thanks, Chad. It's a little tiny, but readable. OK. Cool. Hopefully I didn't merge things that weren't supposed to be merged. This would actually be a bit easier to work with if it wasn't already triangulated, but there's nothing we can do about that. Cool. Collapse. OK. So now the vert number should match again. And you don't have to follow along with this part. You just, yeah. Well, I'm just kind of showing you while you're editing, you can yes. accidentally add and delete a vert, mm -hmm. which will really screw up the ordering and kind of nullify the mesh. But I'm trying to create a situation where it will the mesh will actually think that it's still a valid morph target, and you think that everything is fine. Let's see, reload. Reload all should work. Nope, it's not valid. All right. Let me make a very simple example to Delete that, delete that. When you're copying from your character, just be very careful to delete the existing morpher modifier, because while previewing, it can be pretty easy to have a value in there. There's a lot of sliders. So if you have a morph currently set to like 50% and you don't see it, yeah, I think that it's actually just going to invalidate the mesh completely and adding in those verts is not going to help just because it's being triangulated so why don't we go to a box all right Morph. there it is up top Morpher. Yeah. Cool. So this is our original object. We'll create the morph target for it. Delete the morpher modifier. We're going to start by removing a vert and then we're going to add it back in again and this is just kind of like a very simple example i was trying to do that with the uh the character but since it was triangulated it was kind of making it much difficult to work with all right we're going to cut there we go No, nope, not quite. Yeah. The icon will actually change. Yep, depending on if it's got, got an edge or not. Yep. Like I don't think that properly. Are, nope. <laughs> I see it too. All yeah, right. That was always my, uh, like, a big pain when I was in, I remember, like, first learning 3DS Max, and you're, like, so close. You have to look for that icon change. Yeah, you have to look for the icon change, but... 
That's actually proving to be pretty difficult for me right now. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> distancy. All right, so if I, all right, so that's what I wanted this to show right okay, there. Okay, so that's what it'll so do to you. What's happening uh. is it's a valid morph target because the vert count's the same, but it's still failing because we changed the ordering because I, if everything's in a stack, right? Zero to 2000, whatever. If you delete a vert that's at the bottom, everything in the stack will move down. So that's just something you have to be very careful about whenever you're working with morph targets to maintain the vert order. And there's a lot of modifiers that can alter the vert, for that, the vert order in a way that will completely destroy your morph targets. So let's just say you are trying to create LODs for your morph targets. So you decide to use the uh, optimize or pro-optimize modifier. Well, that actually generates geometry based off of the kind of the form, right? And while it appears to be the exact same object and the vert count will be exactly the same, it won't maintain the correct ordering. And that's why if you try to create LODs and with something like, uh, if you want to make simply gone LODs, the morph targets that you try to associate with them won't always work and it'll horribly deform like that. Yeah, because the vert order matters so much. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we have our established, I actually kind of screwed up that mesh in a way that <laughs> won't allow it to work anymore. Uh, we'll just make another chubby dude, it'll be yeah. fine. Yeah. Sorry about that stream. Um, and people are asking in chat, so when we're, when we're going to export this thing, and you're going to cover it, of course, when we're exporting. Um, when we export all of these, like all these different morphs, this is all one big file with like a ton of different morph guy, or different meshes in it, or? No. Or, nope. Um, what's actually going to be exported is just simply the character itself with mm -hmm. the morph modifier. And all the data is stored within that modifier, so everything will go with it. You don't have to worry about exporting all the meshes. Yep. Awesome. That answers a question from chat. Oh. Let me delete the morpher modifier. There. Yeah. One thing I like to do is as soon as I, you know, I would like to advocate checking your morphs very often because very easily can you mess something up. So as soon as you create a new target, I go ahead and add it to a channel. And I'm going to do bad practice and not name my morph target. I'll actually want to show you why it's bad not to name your morph target, because you can't really go back very easily and change things to be named properly. So I'm going to go ahead and make some mistakes on purpose so you see what errors you're going to run into down the road. And they're not going to be like horrible errors, but they're really annoying to work with. All right. I almost, I'm tempted to just like take this couch and roll it up there. I mean, if you want a little bit, I guess. <laughs> I mean, this rolls for a, for a reason. A little scooch. Yeah, let's, let's do a little scooch. There you go. Yeah. I'll, look in. I'll look it up. I think this should be fine. Anyways. Soft selection. There we go. He's gonna have an alien burst now. Oh yeah, yeah, I can see that. So this is this is why you only get five guys like once every other like few weeks. Can't be eating giant cheeseburgers. Oh, dude, I love five guys. I know. They give you so many fries too. <laughs> you never have to worry about like what order size to get because it's always like bag full of fries. Did you ever notice that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just a giant like grease bag. It's great. Oh, there you go. See, I'm so okay. I think I, I think I'm believing. Uh, he's got a lot of morph going on here. Nice. All right. So we're back to the state. 
Now this concept will apply no matter how many morph targets you have. Let's see, reload. All right, so whenever you update a morph target, you actually have a button that you can reload them without having to add them to the channel again. So everything's good. We're gonna take the character, export, throw it in the desktop and call it Morphin Man. <laughs> okay. I thought you were gonna make a Power Rangers reference there, but all right, keep going. Now, one thing that you have to make sure is checked is under animation, you'll find a deformations tab. Make sure that this here is enabled. Uh, if it's not, obviously it's, it's just not gonna work when you try to import it. All right, and we're gonna finally bring it in. Morphin Man. Now, if you're new to Morph Targets and you haven't worked with them before, uh, it might alarm you when you initially import it uh, because they won't seem to show up. Just make sure that you have Import Morph Targets checked. And that, that's the key option there. It's just a checkbox. It's your friend. Yeah. Like getting the little resize option. Let me just do this. There's some in the group information. That's all right. Yeah, that's another checkbox that we didn't hit. Also, I think that when we imported and exported him, he just lost his smooth and group info, too. Yeah. That was not, not what we're showing off today, though. I'm not worried about it. Oh, right. So here's what, I, what might alarm you. <clears throat> um, when you open the mesh... Bring it over to the right screen. When you move over to the uh, skeleton, it's not going to show up. And typically, all you need to do is just re-import. And then it will start... Hmm, I see. And so it's just that one down there. Yeah, it's, it's just um, a, a weird <clears throat> thing that happens on occasion, and it gets solved pretty easily. You just need to re-import, and then the morphs will come in. Now this error is just saying you need uh, the following materials to support morphs. That's, again, a checkbox. It's pretty easy. So. Oh, the, in the materials, just check it off. Yeah, let me move that out of the way. All so right. these are the two materials associated with it. It might automatically check it. Let's move that over here. So here's our material and go morph. So use with morph targets. It's already checked because it detected that. We just need to save the materials. So just check that, save. Cool. And that oh. error message is gone. Um, last question, what FBX format is it exporting on, 2016? Yeah, I think so. I yeah, this is, uh, I think this is 2016 version of 3ds Max, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. So that would that's it will work on two thousand fourteen as well. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's kind of an it's, old concept. It's been around. Yeah. Now, one interesting thing, and I've actually incorporated this in my workflow. Uh, Unreal Engine does something pretty cool, and it allows you to go in the negative. So it just assumes what the opposite direction is. Yeah. And another cool thing is you can actually input values that go past one. So. You can go past 100% th in 3ds Max. You can't go. You can't go past one in the visualizer here. I don't think, unless you type it. Okay, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> those, are, those are definitely settings. Yeah. So, you can incorporate that in your workflow by creating an island that opens, and then just putting a negative value will allow it to close, like past its point downwards. Like if you just want it to go up and down. All right, so the next thing I wanted to cover is how you can incorporate LODs with your uh, morphs. Because this guy, let's go back to him, actually. Let's see, skeleton, and I'll move it over. So this guy, if it were to LOD to level one, which um, I guess I should go into what LODs are, right? Mm -hmm. So LODs stand for level of detail, and it's essentially a copy of your mesh that is lower in geometry, um, less vertex count, so it's going to be cheaper on the vertex shader. Because you don't want your uh, high poly mesh, you know, at full density when it's far enough away to where you can't see the detail. 
But if the details on the character are big, like this guy, where he's really chubby, at this distance, if he were to LOD to level one, and you would see a pop because he's going to go to his natural state. Mm -hmm. So to get around that, when you create LODs, they have to have the morph modifier as well, and you have to have the same exact name or else it won't work. If you don't have the matching morph target name, then it's not going to associate it with the uh, level zero. So if level zero is you know chubby and level one is something else, when it, as soon as it mips, it's just going to go back down to the default state. That's why I was saying earlier that naming the morph targets is really important. And that caveat is also a very, uh, pro it's, it kind of makes it annoying um, to create the LOD content. Because in 3ds Max, you can't have two objects with the same exact name. So I actually like to use a separate file. But you will see what I mean in a moment. We're going to move that guy back. We're going to take this guy. And underneath there, add a optimize modifier. Whoops. Is that optimize? I can't really see. Good. All right, cool. So our character has its uh, vert count lowered. Going to make a copy of it over here. Delete the skin modifier. Delete morpher. Oops. Cool. We're going to copy this name. Get rid of him for now. Paste it in there. And make him match essentially the same shape. Mm -hmm. uh, the important thing is that he needs to look chubby. I would actually probably use like the, if you're, if you're using a more detailed uh, morph target, probably use that as reference. Um, in this the case, ideal, you just make it The ideal bigger. workflow actually is to model your mesh in a way to where uh, you can actually turbo smooth it or use turbo reverse, which is not a default um, modifier. It's actually a script that you can get off. Like, um, turbo reverse? Yeah. Yeah, turbo smooth is built in, but I've never heard of turbo reverse. Turbo reverse is really cool. I um, haven't even used it. I'm learning so much. <laughs> so turbo reverse, um, it's as you would expect. It goes backwards. You just need to make sure that everything is uh, quads. If you have any triangles, then it's going to get errors. Mm -hmm. But that is kind of a actually how I uh, create morphs for LODs is I just use turbo reverse or I turbo smooth it and then create the morph targets. And then that, that way it's easy to just remove the turbo smooth modifier if you don't want to get any max scripts. You can just look it up on your own. Uh, in this case, since we don't have those cool tools and our mesh is triangulated, um, I'm going to have to just do everything from scratch. But that's not too difficult. Oh, um, someone's asking, what are the difference between morph targets and blend shapes? Those are the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's just it's two names for the same thing. Blend Sorry shapes if I is, confused you, Xavier. Yeah, blend shapes is just a term used in Maya, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to make the same edits. Whoa. And since we're just demonstrating, I'm not going to try yeah, to be Yeah, he doesn't be perfect, perfect, but we get the idea. You yeah. made him big. Just the, yeah, just so you see that it works. Yep. Looks like the name is how it's supposed to be. Let's see here. Oh, let me delete that. And I 
I may have altered it in a way that. All right, cool. So we're going to export this LOD uh, one as a separate FBX file. Everything looks good. We're going to right click Morphin Man, import LOD1. Looks good. All right, now we just need to adjust the uh, screen size so that. Oh, it's a. You can also do the LOD settings up there, too. Oh, yeah, just force it. Yeah. Yeah. See, that'd just be a little easier. Yeah. See, now, now he's okay. Now you see it still morphs. Uh huh. And the reason why that worked is I made sure to copy the name over. Um, if LOD one's name was different in any way, it it just wouldn't activate. Including case sensitivity. Um, I actually am not sure about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. The question from chat was case sensitivity. I have not tested that. I've always just copy and pasted because that's the easiest and safest method. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. I actually, I don't think so. I don't think it'll be a problem, but it's just safe to make sure that you keep the cases in case it is. Okay. So now we've established how you can have LODs working with your uh, morph targets. Um, I'm actually going to go and open the visualizer that I built with the character, which is what you saw for the image. And show you some really cool features that are built in this. I actually have hot keyed some like mm -hmm. already established poses. These are the two that were built in. Um, and I have a debugger. Well, not too bigger, but it's more of just a high and show creases. So I actually created uh, normal maps that'll blend in and out depending on the creasing that should occur. So if you look underneath her eyelid right there, uh, I believe it's the G key. Yeah. yeah. It's very <clears throat> subtle because if you make it over the top, she's going to look very old. Yeah, it like suddenly goes from young to old. Yeah. And you don't want that, but you still want somewhat of the realism of a crease occurring when mm -hmm. you make a certain face. Um, just to show you the difference, those are the laughing lines. It's very subtle, but I think it adds a certain level of realism to a cartoonish character that kind of makes the facial expression pop a little bit. Oh, and also had, I also added worry lines, but in this context it doesn't make sense for them to show up. Oh, huh. yeah, 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 not in that. They'll show up in, with that face. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. And actually, I will just go ahead and show you what the sliders do. These are just the individual uh, morph targets that I've made. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I created this visualizer just so I can make sure that she's capable of making all the expressions that I need. Yep. And uh, it's important to note this is this is you messing around at runtime, like, in game, the slider is directly connected back to a blueprint that's driving those morphs up and right. down, right? Right. So um, I'm only re-emphasizing that because a lot of people in chat were asking things like, "Is this something you want to adjust at run uh, runtime? Can blueprints affect them and all that?" And the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. This is all being driven during runtime, and uh, I also have this really cool. Yeah, moi, moi, moi. Moi, moi. yeah you can yeah, make oh really. Yeah. Okay, so another thing I want to talk about is when you're making morph targets, it's good to make exaggerated morph targets mm -hmm. because you never want to fall short. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense because uh, it's better to have the extreme exaggeration so you can do squash yeah. and stretch through that than, yeah, that makes sense. And the editor does help with that because remember how I said you can go past values, like you can go to like 1.1 or 1.2. Mm -hmm. If you, in the end, you didn't quite make the, uh, make enough headroom for yourself. <laughs> you can you can kind of yeah. push it a little bit more using Unreal Engine, but yeah, you probably want to make sure it's very precise at a certain point, or else it might just kind of go way out this direction on you. So 
let's test to see if I can match like All right, let's your see facial how, let's expressions. See how far we can get this thing. Clint, to the special camera. Yeah. Make some faces for me, Alex. I'm just gonna make a really. <laughs> Come on, we're doing this. All right, we're doing it. So you're gonna have a smile. Looks like your upper lip is up. <laughs> your maybe less. <laughs> Oh, less no, no, serial no, no, killer? No, 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 serial killer is perfect. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead, then. then, yes. Actually, if you can go more serial killer-y, <laughs> then that... I think your eyelids are really open. Yeah, oh yeah, the top of the eyelids. All right. All right, yeah, yeah. So, oh, can you push your uh, eyebrows up any further? Oh, I see. I see. All right. The thing is, I haven't built in individual. Oh, yeah, so you couldn't, like, I couldn't do, we were talking about it earlier, I can't do DreamWorks face, where you have, like, the... Exactly, you don't have the one eyebrow above the other. But I can go ahead and do that real quick, just so you can see an example of how I might add something. Okay, hop back in. Let me go back to the character over here. The hair is a separate uh, mesh, so don't be alarmed that she's bald. <laughs> All right, here's actually an example of where I messed up. So you see here how I have OB jumper jaw, OBJ upper jaw. That is a morph target that I forgot to name, and then I actually named it properly. Teeth Open, I believe is the correct name, and I can't get rid of this name now, unless I were to delete it and re-import, like actually import it from scratch again. Oh boy. So it's really annoying whenever you make an error <clears throat> like that. So that's, that's kind of the thing I was talking about earlier, when you don't name something properly. Um, and that's what uh, you were showing me make like floating teeth on accident because oh yeah because you had the setting off in the blueprint as you want to well. see the uh, floating teeth oh yeah let's well let's let's also talk about the blueprint and then we'll explain the floating teeth yeah the blueprint's actually really simple that I'm using to drive uh, the morph targets you can actually get your uh, skeletal mesh and drag off from there, set morph target. And it's as simple as just entering the name of the morph target and then entering a value associated with it. So as you see, I have teeth open, mouth open. This is, I'm doing a little check here because this, this part of the blueprint is dealing with that slider thing how the, uh, the slider from the widget works is it goes from 0 to 1 depending on the position. So that's positive 1, positive 1, negative 1, negative 1. <laughs> Clint's just over here giggling. Yeah, I hear like giggling in the background. <laughs> uh, I think Clint's just excited. He got me to make that stupid face on the stream. Good. So depending on where that picker position is, if it's like in a positive or negative range, I'll pick uh, which morph target to influence. Because I don't want to go into a negative morph target. Remember Unreal will go into the negative range and actually go the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. But for these morph targets, it didn't look right because uh, I was having her make like the duck face. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. And it's the opposite of that would go like, it was going like stretched out this way. So I needed, I needed her mouth to go wide and curve around her face. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't go into the negative range for that one, which is why I have this check here. So instead it'll, it'll flip. Yeah, depending on... From mouth wide to duck face. Yes. Or duck face <laughs> to mouth wide. Got it. It's actually called duck face. Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, begin play. This is where I'm creating the widget blueprint. And since I'm creating it within the character editor, I can just create a uh, variable from that widget. This is just adding it to the viewport. Now that I have this variable established, I can uh, pull off from it. 
controller, I'm actually twi using two widget blueprints, by the way. Mm -hmm. So controller is one of them. And I'm just getting the sliders. This is just an array that I made from the slider. You know, I made a, an array variable. Uh, this, the reason why I have this gate here is because I don't want the sliders to influence it if I'm using those preset positions. Remember I had the hotkeys set up? So those hotkeys will tell the gate to close so that I'm not actively using the sliders because you can get wonky results from that. And then from there, I just loop through each morph target. This is actually a pretty cool workflow. Um, it saves you a ton of time on the setup. So when you get the object name, in this case it's a slider from the widget blueprint, you just name the slider the same thing as your morph target. And then you get you just input it right there into this node. And it looks like I actually multiplied the value by 1.2 just to kind of exaggerate it a little bit. So that's how the blueprint is set up. All this stuff down here, this is just the hotkeys where I pressed the button and it set all the morphs that I needed to a specific range to make a face. So nothing too special there. Oh, that actually I believe is the uh, normal map blending. So I will go into that a little bit later. Because okay. I think people are probably pretty interested in how I'm blending in specific creases or wrinkles, depending on uh, the situation. Absolutely. Yeah. Then that's just a stray morph. Oh no, I see it now. Yeah. So <laughs> what I had earlier is I bypassed these two and I accidentally had the same morph target twice. And you can set, technically, I'm setting the same morph target twice. Yeah. So be very aware on on this because it's, it's this is little... kind of like a, a last night when I was working on this uh, I had this really creepy uh. <laughs> alien teeth <laughs> I mean some people might want to do that so hey there's a workflow for you if you want I, I've hey. definitely seen games where the jaw goes down and the teeth go up before <laughs> so <laughs> it's not necessarily always intentional so if you want the alien effect you can actually set the same morph target twice, you know, in two different ways. All right. Uh, let me actually fix that, because I don't want that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'll just get confusing later. So I'll get rid of that. Cool. Right. Uh, before I get sidetracked, um, would the stream like me to talk about the normal map blending or go back in and edit like the eyebrows? Uh, probably normal map blending is, is a okay. good way to do it. And uh, another thing that's um, been coming up on uh, YouTube chat, they were really interested in you have the circle that you're using on the UMG because the sliders are all pretty obviously a sliding scale, right. but uh, they're just curious how you're blending everything together for the mouth. Okay, right. Um, so I'll get, that's more UMG stuff, and yeah. I'll get into that later. Cool. But cool. let me talk about the normal map stuff. So let's open her normal map. And we're at uh, uh, 245. OK. Just a heads up. Cool. All right. This is the wrinkle hair in. Let me just open the head material so you can Oh, yeah, bring it on over. All of the action is happening in the material. It's actually a dynamic material instance. Um, we have documentation on how to implement dynamic materials. Mm -hmm. And so it's just parameters driving it. Yes. Um, cool. This is the section down here that's really important. So this is the baseline normal map for the entire head. Let me just move that over. So this is very smooth. There aren't any wrinkles or creases on this. What I'm doing is I'm taking something like this. This looks like this is the crease around the eyes. I'm pulling off from the red and green channel. The end strength, that's just normal strength. Um, you can multiply the red and green channel to improve the how exaggerated that normal map's going to be. Maybe I should demonstrate that um, because this can be pretty important. So I just activated the eye wrinkle. Yeah, you can see it's a slight darkening under the eye there. 
You oh, see that? Yeah, you just cranked it up a lot. Yeah, I, I can just, oh, let me move this over. So this, this uh, parameter value, if I just crank it up. Yeah, she got a little, yeah, she looks like she got popped in the face once. It's not good. Let me turn that off. Actually, that might be really good if you're doing a fighting game and you really want to show, like, bruises and stuff start to show up as they're fighting over time, stuff like that. Damage is taken. Yeah, and this is what I was talking about earlier, how you can quickly mm -hmm. make her look really old if I start pumping up all of these uh, values. Let's let it compile for a second. Oh, actually, this would be a better... <laughs> She's looking straight crazy for a second there. She really had the, the face nailed. Oh, so yeah, if you want to make a char if you want to make a character designer system that makes people old, um, it's just it's just ramping up the normal map, and and you can see yeah. that in a lot of in a lot of those games. Once you see it once and you notice that's what it is, you can't unsee it. Yeah. Just to give you guys another look, so um, to get that uh, exaggerated strength, you just multiply the red and green channel, make a float three. I'm making sure that the blue channel is completely nullified. And this is lurping between uh, zero, essentially zero, 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 and B, which is our exaggerated red and green channels. And we're just adding it straight to the base normal map. You just add it on top of those normals, if that makes sense. So it's a really, really simple setup, but pretty effective. Um, I'll just give you guys a moment to look at it. I'm just doing the same thing over and over again. And let me open the actual texture that I'm using. For this to work, let me move this over. <clears throat> I just have a primarily blue area with just the uh, edited normals that I wanted in there. So I just kind of lerp that in, if that makes sense. All right. You minimize that. And I didn't have time to set this up, but if you wanted to be more optimal, you would actually cut out all the unneeded space and just have that top right corner and then use the uh, panner to move the UVs to essentially move the texture where it's supposed to be, right? So technically, if, you're, you, have, if you have like a 2K map on your character head and you want to wrinkle you want to add wrinkles that only take up like a 512 space, 512 by 512. You can make your texture that size, but for that to work... You need the whole entire face like up in that corner. Uh, for that to work, you need clamp to be... Oh. You need to set the, ramp, uh, the wrap settings on here. Let's see. It's not in there. It's under texture, I believe. So it's by default set to wrap. What that means is if you scale the UVs up and down, it's going to uh, lap, it's going to repeat over and over again. If you set that to clamp, what will happen is it'll stay small and it'll just extend blue in all directions. And what you do is you, <coughs> then you pan, use a panner to like manually move. Just set the, the, the time to zero so that it doesn't actually pan continuously and just set a static value so that it just moves the texture over to where it's supposed to be on that quadrant, right? Yeah, and then that's just where all of that data of that particular area that you want. Yeah, that way you're not wasting a ton. That way you don't have like a 2K map for every wrinkle. You just have like a 512 or 128, whatever you need. Yeah, uh, Sayo off of the of Twitch chat said that like exact phrase, a 2K texture for each part of the face wastes a bit of memory. Yeah, you don't, you don't need to do that. Um, I just didn't have time to set, set that up. But that's how you would go about doing it. You would take your texture, set it to clamp, and then just move the UVs over to the desired location. And that's actually a way to uh, add things like scars as well without using uh, decals if you wanted to go through that route. Because it can be pretty annoying trying to get everything lined up in the right space. All right. So let's talk about the workflow that I took to get 
those wrinkle maps. I'll open this up. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> and that's, uh, we're on uh, 253. So. Yeah, so I might need to cut out making the uh, some additional morph targets for the female face. Mm -hmm. But you guys already saw the process of making a morph target. It's all the same thing. I would just create another morph target out of these this grouping, mm -hmm. and then just click export it, and then click re-import, and it'll just automatically update. So that's all there is really to it. Um, so if you want to create a wrinkle map, I took a face. Like I like to take um, the smiling face, like this one, and export it to something like ZBrush. Right, and actually sculpt directly onto it. So uh, I'll subdivide it many times. And since it already has the UVs unwrapped, because by that point you'll you'll have your UVs unwrapped, and it's an exact copy of your base mesh, just in a different position. I'll go in. Get rid of these extra detail, details. Sculpt in the wrinkles here, here, here. And then re-import the high poly mesh. An example of one is already in here. You know, something like this. Oh, I was talking to Alex earlier how I got I went about uh, retopologizing. Oh, that's what that is, a little chunk of you yeah. explaining that from earlier. Because, yeah, you can, you can see the verts in this one. <laughs> yeah, so this is like a high poly sculpt um, from ZBrush. And this is where you would have your morph target overlapping it because um, you would have sculpted on the smiling version. You re-import it, and you would use uh, draw material to render tar or uh, what's it called? Rendered texture in here. So I would say look that up. Yep. Render to texture. That's, that's how you make all of your maps. Yeah. It's so really you would just have it overlapping. You would mm -hmm. use the morph target to actually bake the map down. OK. And that's how I made the wrinkle maps. And I just separated each wrinkle. Like uh, if you saw in the project, I actually had a, a 2K map with all the wrinkles on one. Uh, that's what this wrinkle map is. Mm -hmm. It has. That's basically that mesh I was telling, talking to you about. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's like everything at once. Yeah, and I just separated each section out by, you know, painting in blue over the areas I don't want. And then you would just cut that out, like crop out what you don't need, and like I said, use the painting method to move it where it needs to be in relation to the, the main texture. It's like somebody just like drowned in quicksand, blue quicksand. <laughs> yeah, I guess right. it does look like someone drowned in blue quicksand. So Thank you, Clint. <laughs> I believe we can actually end it there. Okay, we can, uh, yeah, we might have to come, uh, have you come back on and uh, talk about more as you do things, but uh, we do have quite a few questions that we want to get to before we hit the uh, hour mark. Right. We're getting close on it. So um, thank you all out there for sending in your questions. Um, let's see here. Now, actually, a lot of people in chat have also brought this up, but how would you do facial animation uh, for a uh, phoneme-based system? And uh, another person was asking, like, oh, couldn't I just kind of take uh, text and, like, try to create a system where I sync up mouth shapes through morphs to, like, text as it comes in? Uh, what do you think yeah. about all that? I think, ideally, you would have a uh, morph target for each individual shape that you would need for every vowel or sound that you need. Yeah. Um, but that depends on how detailed you want to get. And that actually is going to up the number of morph, tar morph targets you're going to need. So it's kind of like a performance-based thing. Do you want the additional morph targets and the additional detail? Or do you want this system? This is actually, uh, let me show you here. I can get a lot of mileage out of this system where I just have very basic shapes set up. I'm blending between uh, four states. So the four states are the duck face. Mm -hmm. the one wide is face. yeah, something's wide, and then open and close, mm -hmm. and then you just have some controls for the lips. And if you can rise and lower the lip in relation to the teeth, you can actually get a ton of mileage with that with not very many morph targets. So I think it depends on how much detail you want to get, and the kind of style of your game. I'm kind of going more with the cartoonish style here. 
so I don't need something super specific. But I think uh, having a morph target for each sound that you make yeah. would be ideal. Yeah, so this is like a, um, not necessarily the whole alphabet, but every like core um, uh, sound shape. Now, I think it's interesting having like a, a system where you enter text and it automatically goes to that. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't experimented with anything like that. I know that I'm using UMG to drive the morphs in this case. So I'm sure that you can set up a system to where I could actually make it as simple as pushing a button and it automatically goes to that. Uh, yeah, because it's just a series of numbers that say drive yeah. the float value to this, this, and this, and therefore it is this face so, shape. Yeah, you can just set up a, a sequence of values that just go one after the other mm -hmm. um, for each morph target. That makes perfect sense. Uh, All right. So um, next question here. Uh, how would you deal with implementing body corrective morphs that might have influence on a character's costume? Uh, if the character has like 20 different costumes he can wear, would on the only solution would be have each of those have a matching set of correctives? Okay, so I don't think it would be ideal if you're going to have many different costumes and different potential areas that you might clip. You're not going to want to create a morph target for every single... Like if you have a clip here, you don't want to make a morph target just to adjust that. And if, you have, if you're clipping here, have a morph target to adjust that. Um, I think it would be more optimal just to scale the bones in that case, just to kind of compress the uh, verts of the character underneath the clothing so that's kind of hidden. Or you can use a material to hide the uh, verts of the character. Or you can just straight up have a version of the character. This is probably better. Have a version of the character with those verts removed. Oh, that makes sense. So it's more like just the head chunk. Yeah, up just why, here. why not just have just the head? Yeah. And then just have a version of the character with just the head and just the shoulders and arms. Yeah, and then you can put on whatever harbricks but and various you're, clothing. You're going to have to streamline your, uh, you're going to have to make uh, your art pipeline to keep that into account. So all of your shirts, for example, mm -hmm. Keep into account that your tor your arm's only going to go this far, right? Yeah. Because you don't want a shirt that's uh, sleeveless and you know has a gap here, and then suddenly you realize that oh, there's they a lift torso. up the arm and you can yeah. see straight. Th I've actually had that happen in a couple of games where some like the character has like a wave animation. It's like, oh look, you can see into the world yeah. through them. Yeah. So just keep Be that in mindful. mind. But no, I, I wouldn't say ideally you would want to use morphs for that case. When it comes to uh, using morphs for corrective blending. That's like something like if I bend my arm and my elbow needs to have that bone pop out. A morph target's great for that. Yeah. And uh, the reason why, that, that's kind of like going into the advantages of morph targets over uh, bone animation. Like, I, I forgot to go over that, but in the, the face, for example, there's kind of a, a workflow where you set up many bones in the face, and each kind of has its own influence or its own verts weighted to it. But with that method, um, you can do things like mocap with facial animations. But you have to have a ton of bones set up to have the, the accurate uh, facial expressions that you need. So it might be best to use morph targets because of a really cool optimization that we have added in the engine. Uh, if you go to project settings, whoops. Oh, that's editor preferences. Close. There you go. Right here, use GPU for computing morph targets. So we're under uh, engine rendering, and yep. then you just typed in morph to get this option. Yep. And this is a really cool option because typically it's uh, going to be taxing on the CPU. And if that's where your bottleneck is, if you're profiling your game and you're like, ah, there's a lot of strain on the CPU, and these morph targets are just you know, driving my frame rate down, you can check this, and that way it puts the load on the GPU. Because mm -hmm. GPUs these days are just monstrously powerful. Yeah, yeah, we so, definitely put a lot of uh, time, energy, and effort into making those more powerful. So yeah, because of the optimization feature that we added, it might be good to use morph targets uh, for cases like corrective blending or for the face. Mm -hmm. All, All right. right. So um, I think let's see here. It's, so what's memory performance like for morph targets? Anyhow, uh, one of many. Uh, sorry, one of my people. Uh, wait. Oh, huh. one of my people is really, really, con oh, one of my people, what? Sorry, the English on that one <laughs> threw me off for a second there. And I totally misread the question a couple of times. Sorry, uh, someone I know is really, really concerned about additive morph targets on characters, mixing smiles and, and uh, frowns. Uh, they're both floats, so if you combine them, it can get ugly. Um, so yeah, I guess what's memory performance cost versus uh, bone animation? I think that 
depends on mm -hmm. the number of verts being affected at a time. That's, I think that's fair. And it depends on the character, how detailed. With this character, she's not especially high poly. It's going to not be that big of a deal. If you have a really detailed mesh, it's going to be more on, on the performance hit side. But at the same time, um, like I said, actually that uh, feature I just showed you where you can put all the load on the GPU might assist in cases where the morph targets are like hitting performance because you have such a detailed mesh with a lot of birds that so you're trying to m calculate their movement on uh, runtime. So like, it's with a lot of performance based things, it really depends on the content. Uh, you just have to have artists that are aware of how to create their content in a way that works well with the engine features. Okay. Um, let's see. And one last thing, I think I might close it after uh, this last question. Let me, let me just pick from the list. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Uh, this one, I think, uh, if you know anything about it. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with the Blender uh, workflow. I know that when it comes to Blender, the fundamentals of make sure that you have the same vert count Keep in mind, I'm sure mm -hmm. they have the same process of each vertex has a number, yes, and it uses do. the associated vertex mm -hmm. uh, to calculate where to move to. So yeah, there's a, there's really not a, t a huge difference in the Blender workflow versus the 3ds Max workflow. There, they just have different UI set up. It's all morph targets. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just reading oh, okay. through it real quick. Um, so I actually kind of already. You covered most covered of these Covered some of these. Yep. But let me just reiterate some things. OK, sure. So when it comes to bones versus morph targets, um, I think it's good to use a little bit of both. And bone, bone scaling is good for certain scenarios, but you run into the problem of the deformations not looking very accurate. That's kind of the pro of morph targets, is you can hand tailor the shape of your morph target, right? So you can hand tailor how something looks. That's why when you bend your elbow this way, if you only have bones, it's going to look like a hose bending, yep. um, depending on how the verts are weighted. And if you have a morph target shaped like an elbow to blend to, then it can look really nice. So cool. that's kind of one of the aspects of, you know, one of the advantages of morph targets. And I think that you should use them together. Um, when it comes to scaling bones, use them, I guess, if you can, because it's going to be cheaper than just using morph targets to control everything. It, it'll just be cheaper just to scale that bone down and just, like if, for example, the shirt, hiding yes. things under the shirt. I think it'll be cheaper. I think that's a, actually a pretty clever idea. I hadn't even considered just scaling them down to like they're super skinny and then like pop them back up to a regular size or whatever to get you them You just have to be way. careful because it will influence the animation. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to scale things in a way to where it won't screw up the animation. That I'm sure people who are doing this are aware, but if you scale down, like for example, things are built based on a hierarchy. So anything down the line from those bones, like your spine to your shoulders to your arms, are going to get influenced by that. So just be careful uh, when you're scaling bones around. OK, uh, cool. I think that's uh, all the time that we have for today. If anyone out there has more questions for us, please come to forums.unrealengine.com and go to the events section. You'll see a morph target, uh, getting started with morph targets live stream that you can comment on, and we'll make sure to pop in there and say hey and see what we can get y'all. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out. We'll see you again on Thursday at 2 p.m. for the Unreal, uh, regular Unreal stream. Um, thank you, Ed, so much right. for coming out and showing thank everything you. off. All right, we'll see you all later. Mm -hmm.